the, for those of you who are disappointed that you couldn't look at the ram, ramified prime counts in the list of number of fields, this was fixed very quickly yesterday. I, I, Edgar posted an issue on our GitHub, uh, or somebody in the audience posted an issue on our GitHub repo, and it was actually fixed before I got back to my uh, hotel room. So if I go here, I can um, look at the ramified prime counts. And since I'm feeling brave, I'm even going to sort in reverse order. So take a second. It's got to sort 21 million number fields, but we can find out which number field in the LMFDB has the most ramified primes. And there it is, uh, number field of degree 43. And then a deceptively simple equation, but we can see all the primes that are ramified listed there. Okay. The other thing I wanted to mention, um, I guess apologize for, is I know many of you ran into difficulties during yesterday's problem session. Um, this was not necessarily due to a bug, but it was really a battle to the death between two web servers, Apache 2 and our Jupyter Hub web server, that uh, were happy to coexist when there were only a half dozen or a dozen people accessing them, but when they got hit with 100 students at once, they each started fighting over who should be taking charge. Um, we chose our Jupyter Hub server, so Apache she is now gone from our server, and everything seems to have been working smoothly throughout the day. Um, so I invite you to, you're welcome to follow along in this lecture. My hope is that everything will work fine. The lecture notes, the link to the lecture notes is posted on the Zulip. Um, one note also, and this is relevant to the problem sessions, when you're opening things that are in the course folder, which all the links I post to the Zulip will be, and even in here, if I go into links and pull up um, uh, notebooks, you can look at them, you can even run code snippets and make changes, but you can't save anything because you don't have right access to the course folder directory. And that's a good thing because otherwise your changes would instantly be visible to everybody else and then you'd start competing with each other to save your changes. So when you're doing a problem in the problem session, which you want to do, the first thing you want to do with a notebook that's linked to in one of the problem notes is to, when you go to save it, you can also say, I want to save this in a different place. And then you should save it in your default directory, your home directory up top where it'll be private to you and you can make whatever changes you want and no one else will be able to, to, to see them. If instead you would like other people to see them, or you would like to share your full notebook with someone else, one thing you can do is make a copy of it. I don't, you shouldn't use this as sort of your primary editing spot, but you can make a copy of it to the shared folder. But the shared folder is like sort of a big table with random stuff on it in the middle of a huge room that people walk by every day. Anybody can put anything they want on the table and anybody can take anything. And there's no safeguards in place to prevent people from doing the same thing at the same time. So really the way to use the shared folder is really as put, put your file there with some distinctive name and then you could let people know it's there. Um, but try not to edit files that are there unless, unless, I guess, if you're the one who put them there. For those of you who say, wait, wait I want to do collaborative notebook editing. I want to be able to have me and all my collaborators be, you know, type working away in the same notebook at the same time, changing cells left and right. And there's a wonderful resource that will allow you to do that online. It's called CoCalc, um, and I highly recommend it. It's very well suited to this, that kind of collaborative interaction. Our Jupyter Hub notebook is not. Okay. All right. With that out of the way, um, let's begin. The goal for today is to sort of take an initially, initial step, dip our toes into the world of actual, actually writing code in each of these uh, different computer algebra systems. Uh, before I do that, one uh, last announcement I wanted to make is I, I understand that not everybody was able to complete the scavenger hunt because of some of the technical issues we ran into. I encourage you to do so whenever you have time. It doesn't, it doesn't take that long when the server's actually working correctly and you can access everything without a problem. Um, and as I said yesterday, if I had one goal for the course, it would be to get everybody through the scavenger hunt. Um, and if you're, if, if you're needing any motivation or maybe even a hint, let my t-shirt inspire you. Okay. All right. With that out of the way, let's get started. Um, so when it comes to turning math into algorithms or you know, turning something you might have, some cool example or maybe some cool result or something you want to investigate that you read in a paper, you want to open up your computer algebra system and start playing with it, you're now in the position of trying to turn math into code. And one thing to keep in mind, um, for those of you who may not have done this before, is that what makes for a good mathematical definition doesn't necessarily make for a good algorithm or a good way to work with an object in a computer algebra system. And so I thought, I 
just start with a very simple example, something that's familiar to everyone. Let's, let's consider the Fibonacci numbers, which have a very simple, elegant, beautiful mathematical definition. Moreover, it's a definition that lends itself immediately to an algorithm. So let's go ahead and write an algorithm to compute Fibonacci numbers. Um, so I'm going to start out with, I'm just doing these in alphabetical order. I'll start out with GP. By the way, today is the only day where I'm going to take you through the ordeal of doing something in every single one of these systems. After today, the instructions will be just pick whichever one you like the best, okay? Or whichever one you'd like to learn, maybe not the one you like the best. Okay, so in GP, we want to define our Fibonacci function. Um, so, and this is one exercise where I'd ask you, don't follow along with me. Don't type this function in yourself and don't run it. You'll see why. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, you're, you're welcome to type it in, just don't run your function. Because <laughs> remember, I said this was an example of, of how definitions don't always make for good algorithms. Um, so what am I doing here? So Ian, I'm, I'm creating a function in GP that I'm going to call fib, for short for Fibonacci, fib of n. And what is this function? Well, the equal sign is telling you what it is. It's a function that is, if n is less than or equal to 2, I'm not going to worry about negative n. If the user inputs a negative number, they get what they deserve, which is 1. Uh, for positive numbers, though, they'll get, if it's 1 or 2, they, it should return 1. So then, well, an if then else construct works in GP is if looks like a function that takes three arguments. The first thing is the condition to test. The second thing is what to do when that condition's true. In GP, these are called closures. These are, you know, any argument can actually be code that gets executed. And then the third argument is what to do if the condition's not true. So if n is less than or equal to 2, it should return 1. Otherwise, it should execute the Fibonacci recurrence. And you need to close the parenthesis, and that's it. And just to, we'll, as good software engineers, we will um, write a quick test just to test it on some small cases and make it sure it gives us the answer we think it should. Um, hopefully I got all the parentheses right. I didn't. Mm. Yes, I can. Is that good enough? Okay. Um, yeah. Unexpected. Thank you. Yeah, making it bigger helps me too. Great, it printed out what I think look like the first 10 Fibonacci numbers. Um, okay, uh, let's go ahead and compute the hundredth. <laughs> well, I mean, it's 100, not 10, right? It'll take, it should take a little longer. Maybe let's, let's give it some time. Well, maybe GP is just slow at computing Fibonacci numbers, so let's, let's switch over to Magma. Maybe Magma can do this better. I know Magma I'm a little, a little better, so I'm less likely to make typos. Or I'm, I'm as likely to make typos, but I'm less likely to make language errors. And I know I'm writing Magma code, so I have to put a semicolon after everything. Got it in one. Okay. Let's see if Magma can give us the hundredth Fibonacci number. Hmm. No joy. Let's let's try Oscar. <clears throat> Oscar's newer, so maybe Oscar knows how to compute. And Julia is supposed to be really fast. Question mark, if I can type it. And this is, yeah, this is like programming in teams, except I have a team of 100 looking to catch my typos. So please shout them out when you see them. This is how you specify a range. And Julia, it's 1 colon 10. I'm going to remember to use println because if I use print, it doesn't put a carriage return at the end, and that's always annoying. In every other, in all the other systems, print will add a carriage return. This working. You want to see if there's anything going on, Edgar? We'll go over to Sage now. I 
I can even do it this way. And I remember in Sage, because we're using Python 3, if I want to print something, I have to put parentheses around it. I can't, like I said, I could in Python 2, where I could have just said print space for then. Okay. Oop. Let me go see if... restart my Julia kernel. This is what you should do if you have a kernel that doesn't seem to be doing what you think it ought to be doing. This is actually straight Julia code. I didn't type using Oscar because I actually know that Oscar, they're, they're, Oscar hasn't added any, added any functionality that I'm actually using here. We'll see an example, an example when we do the Civ where, a, a little later, when we do sums of cubes where I do need to do using Oscar. Okay, so it looks like it was just my kernel was in a weird state. In general, it's, you know, it's just when anything goes wrong, turn it off and turn it on is always a good, the, the first step in any tech problem. Restarting your kernel is the equivalent of turning things on and off. Okay, well, maybe my now GP is finished. Nope. Um, how about magma? Nope. 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 And if you happen to, I didn't try it here. Let's, sorry, let's do it. And if you happen to be logged in, you could even go to the console. Wait, yeah, let's, let's, let's show you how to do that. I could go here, and I could go to the terminal, and I could do top, and I could see that there are, Hopefully there should be somebody working away. I'm a little confused as to why they're not, but they are computing, they are doing some, oh yeah, there they are, I see. Sorry, my eyes are a little slow. You probably can't see that because it's way too small, but there are several jobs running at 100%, which makes me think that a few of you didn't follow my instructions and actually did type this in, but that's okay. This is a big server. It can handle a half a dozen of us doing the wrong thing, but not 100. Okay, so I'm gonna abandon this and um, give up. I'm gonna stop the kernel on all of them. Some of them will actually give you information when you stop telling you something useful about what it was trying to do. Um, so if I go into uh, Sage, trims the uh, stack dump, but uh, in uh, GP, you can actually see that it was, you know, fairly deep, but not really that deep in this recursion. You might have wondered, shouldn't, you know, maybe my, uh, should get a stack overflow because I'm running a recursive function, maybe the stack recursion was too deep. Nope, this is actually a very shallow recursion, but it's very broad because it's branching at two by two at each level, and at the bottom, which is only 100 levels deep, it's like two to the hundred, yeah. Um, okay. So what if we actually wanted to compute Fibonacci numbers? Well, there, you'll, there's a bonus problem on the problem set where you could find at least a dozen different ways to compute Fibonacci numbers. I'll just try one of them. I'm only, my only purpose in doing this is to show you that, um, I guess I should grab the upper right corner, show you that uh, it's perfectly feasible to compute Fibonacci numbers even with values much greater than 100 using, um, any of these four systems. So here I just did the standard trick of exp exponentiating this matrix and picking the right-hand corner. Yeah, maybe you don't believe me, that's the hundredth. Let's just check that it gets, oh, I'm off by one. Okay, so I wanted the eleventh one. Yeah, so I would want the hundred and one. So there's the hundredth Fibonacci number. I could get the thousandth. I could get the ten thousandth. Oop. I could get the hundred thousandth. No problem, okay. Okay, so with that life lesson out of the way, maybe I'll pause for questions. Yeah, in the back. Excellent question. So the question was, if you saved all the things you've already computed so that it didn't have to keep computing the same thing over and over again, would that make the function more efficient? And the answer is yes, as you'll see if you do the problem set I mentioned. That's actually the very second problem. The first step is analyze the computational complexity of the program we just ran. And then the second problem, part of the problem is analyze the computational complexity if you use what's known as memoization, which is precisely what you suggested. Don't compute something you already know. Cache every, uh, every return value. And you'll see that that makes it dramatically faster. But that's still, even with that improvement, it's still far from the best way to compute Fibonacci numbers. They're much better. Okay. Any other questions? All right. 
So, now I want to take the sort of the opposite perspective. So that was an example of a great definition that didn't lend itself necessarily to a good algorithm. And this is, you know, maybe, I don't know, four or five hundred years ago. I'm not sure exactly when Fibonacci was around, but um, I want to know, go, now go back much further in history and look at what I would say is still today very definitely should be on the top ten list of all algorithms in computational number theory. It's right up there with the Euclidean algorithm, which came out around the same time. Um, but I think in some ways that, you know, the, the, the Civ of Eratosthenes is even is even cooler and even more impressive. You probably don't think so because it's probably something you learned in grade school, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody can do the sieve. Um, I know there's lots more sophisticated things one can do with primes, but I just want to um, use the sieve both as I think a good first non less trivial coding example than the Fibonacci, also to give credit to Eratosthenes or whoever it was that actually developed the sieve that bears Eratosthenes' names, because it's quite ingenious and it achieves what even today is an extremely impressive running time on average. And that will be something that we'll come back to in some of the later lectures when we talk about uh, computing, for example, traces of Frobenius, or as David Harvey will be talking about in week three, computing zeta function in functions in what's known as average polynomial time. Aristosthenes, you know, beat, uh, beat us to it by 2,000 years by giving an amazingly powerful average polynomial time algorithm for enumerating prime. 2,000 years ago. Okay, so how does this algorithm work? Just to remind you, um, I, you know, this is one form. Uh, there are other ways one could, could construct it, but I wanted to just pick what I think is the simplest and would be easy to implement in all these languages, but require us to know a little bit more than we needed to know to write the Fibonacci pro pro program. So we're going to create a vector. Just think of this, if you, if you think of the sieve of Aristosthenes as you write a big grid with boxes on it and you're going to cross out primes. Well, each of those boxes contains either a tin contains a cross or it doesn't. So it's a Boolean value. And so we're going to create an array or a vector of n Boolean values. Our goal is to enumerate the primes up to n. And we're initially going to say, well, we don't know anything. Let's just assume everything is prime. I mean, two's prime, three's prime, everything's prime. And back then, they probably considered one prime, too. We don't, prime one is no longer prime. It got demoted just like poor Pluto. Um, OK. But so then how, do, how does the algorithm work? Well, then we know that one's prime. We have to actually put in a special case for that. We, we, so one is really a special case. So we're going to skip over one, just leave it set to true, because we already know it's prime. It's not, sorry. <clears throat> All but the first, yes, sorry. We set the one to false in the first step. I forgot to read my own, my own writing. So we set one to false, and then for every successive integer p, I'm not calling p a prime yet because I don't know it's prime. I'm just calling it an integer. p is going to go from 2 to the square root of n, and I'm going to check whether s sub p, the pth element of our vector array, is set to true. And that means it hasn't been crossed off yet. And 2 hasn't been crossed off yet because we haven't done, done any crossing off. So 2 is prime. And so we're now going to cr cross off all the multiple proper multiple multiples of 2 by just, uh, you know, we could do this by incrementally adding p to p and crossing off all the multiples m between 2p and n. Okay, so that's... In this algorithm, we're going to cross off every multiple of p greater than p. There are many optimizations one can do, and they're going to be considered in one of the exercises. Um, but let's stick with this, because this is the way I've got the coding examples set up. <clears throat> OK. Yeah, and in fact, we don't need to go all the way up to n either. There are many, many much more clever things. And in fact, we could invert the sieve so that we only run over odd numbers, or we could implement a wheel, or we could implement a recursive wheel to improve the running time. There are a million different things we could do. I wanted to start with what I think is the absolute bog standard simplest one. My guess is that Aristosthenes implemented something close to this algorithm. OK. And then when we're done crossing off all the primes, we are a little bit clever about going up to uh, stopping at the square root of n. But in fact, if we replace the square root of n with n as our bound, it wouldn't change the complexity of the algorithm at all. Okay. It's only going to be a constant factor improvement. And then at the end, we're going to output everything that didn't get crossed off. Those are our, our list of primes. And before I jump in to uh, show you some of the code, just let's consider, appreciate the complexity of this algorithm. So what are we doing in this algorithm? Well, we're, we're going to, for each prime that we haven't, for each number we haven't crossed off, and all the ones we haven't crossed off are primes. So for each prime, we're going to cross off all the multiples of p up to n. And we're going to do that by adding p 
successfully. So we're going to do n over p additions and then a crossing off. A crossing off actually takes less time than the addition, so we could just focus on how long it takes to uh, do an addition. If we're adding um, two numbers that are less than or equal to n, well, they can all be represented in roughly log n bits, say log 2n bits. And so the complexity of adding two n, uh, log n bit numbers is O of log n. And so we're doing this um, for each prime p, and the number of additions we do for each prime is n over p. So we compute the sum of n over p or log n, we get O of n log n log log n. And for those who aren't familiar, I'll just remind you what the big O notation means. Um, it's denoting a set of functions. Um, there's a standard abuse of notation going on here that equality doesn't really mean inequality. It's asserting something about functions represented by the left-hand side or contained in the fun set of functions represented on the right-hand side. But I think it's fairly intuitive and well-established notation, so we'll stick with it, but you're welcome to read, up, read more about it if you want. And I put a cautionary note just to remind you that it is not, strictly speaking, inequality, and in in particular, it is not symmetric. So n is O of n squared, and also O of n cubed, and also O of x to the n. Um, these are just upper bounds. And it also has uh, an, uh, an excellent, uh, you know, well, excellent on average space complexity, which is one bit for integer up to n, but not so great x complexity if you're thinking about it as a function of n, so it's O of n bits. Um, as I men mentioned, um, in addition to the optimization that uh, Hendrik referred to, there are many optimizations one can do. The most significant is to use what's known as a recursive wheel, which, which will actually improve the asymptotic complexity by a log, log n squared factor. Um, the space, the most important practical improvement, uh, in addition to using the recursive wheel, is, is not to actually have your Boolean array go out, have n elements, but just do them in blocks of n squared at a time. You can achieve the same time complexity with much less space complexity. Um, but I'll just note that even this bog simple algorithm, we, what would be another algorithm? Well, we could, uh, another algorithm would be just integer, in, 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 inter, iter, iterate the integers from one to n and just test whether they're prime. I mean, primality testing is a very well studied subject. There are lots of interesting and wonderful algorithms out there, including a polynomial time algorithm. So why wouldn't we just apply our polynomial time algorithm to each prime? It, it's polynomial time in the logarithm of the prime, the, the order, the polynomial in the number of bits. Well, even if we did that, um, the best, the, the complexity we'd get would be something like n times log n to the sixth. Okay. We could use a faster algorithm. We could be a little bit more, uh, a little bit uh, less insistent on a deterministic algorithm. We could use instead a Las Vegas algorithm, um, which would give us results that uh, would give us a running time of something on the order of n log cubed n, but that's still much, much worse than something that is running, um, if we think about the complexity of our sieve, its running time was n log n log log n. It, we're, we're asking what is the average time per prime? Well, there's n over log n primes. So if we divide by n over log n, we get O of log squared p log log p per prime. That's how much time it's spending. And that's faster than any primality test that's known. Okay. All right. There, we could get close to it using a Monte Carlo test, but this is a rigorous algorithm, and it's a, a rigorous deterministic algorithm. And if we apply the improvement using the, what, I, what I mentioned uh, before, the, the wheeled sieve, we can actually achieve a compl an average uh, complexity that's better than any primality testing known, even one that is allowed to use as much randomness as it wants and be wrong 51% of the time. Okay, so this is, you know, I, so I hope you appreciate the, the power 